Hello. Okay. Uh, let's pray first. Father, we thank you for this morning and we pray that you help us as we continue studying about the Old Testament, the Word of Wisdom and guidance in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay. Now, in the last lesson, we learned about uh, the liberals, right? We uh, introduced the whole perspective of, you know, people who don't believe in, uh, in the, the authority of the written word of the Bible. Okay? And uh, to kind of give you a bit of a background on to who these liberals really are, right? Uh, and unfortunately for us, you know, they occupy most of the, they populate most of the theological, top theological schools in the world, from Yale Divinity School, to Princeton Divinity School, to Harvard Divinity School, to Cambridge, to Oxford, and, and, and all the top, top groups. Um, where did these guys come from? Why did they kind of think the way they do, which seems so weird, right? You've got four different authors, da da da, and things like that, right? Uh, let's start off with by saying um, one of the major um, groups of liberals started with the Germans, okay? The German liberal uh, theological school. Now, uh, there's this guy called Schleimacher. Now, I think I mentioned him before. Do you all remember his name? Steinmacher, no? Roughly? This guy who basically was a seminary student, so he, he knows a little bit of theological stuff. And uh, he was a, um, the spelling might differ in terms of it, right? But basically it's a free to use okay? So he wanted to make Christianity relevant and uh, reasonable to his friends, who were all like atheists and you know science and all that and this was in the you know 18th century like 1700 something and um, he basically wrote a whole long treatise about religion to say that uh, you know religion is still relevant today because a lot of people are already kind of saying you know why do we need religion we cannot we cannot rely on this authority we cannot rely on the bible because uh, we have seen in 1517 uh, through the work of the german monk uh, Martin Luther, that the church can get things wrong, right? Before that, the church kind of said that, no, look, we are the church, we are the emissaries of God on the earth, you cannot question us, uh, so, you know, you, 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 everything we say is true, okay? Kind of like parents, right, in some ways. Uh, you know, we are your parents, you came from us, blah, 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 and things like that. They use that kind of card that they, their parents sometimes like to use. Uh, but Martin Luther pointed out that the church was wrong in its own, in its basic text, right? He using uh, different parts of the, of the Bible itself in its original languages to show that the church's interpretation of these passages was problematic. And that started what is known as the Reformation. And uh, in Reformation, uh, Martin Luther originally wanted to, to challenge the Catholic Church to change some of its practices. Uh, but that only happened 400 years later in what is known as Vatican II. But what inevitably happened was that he got kicked out of the Catholic Church. He got excommunicated. Martin Luther. Yes. Uh, and to a Catholic, excommunication means condemning the person to hell. Okay? Meaning, for the, the Catholics, they believe that uh, once you are outside of the Catholic Church, whatever church you call yourself, you know, Protestant, uh, or whatever, right? You know, you are not saved, and you can be kicked out of the church, excommunicated, right? Uh, and the word communicated is not the normal communication that we say. With X is out, okay? And communicato, you go out of the church, or you go out of communication or fellowship, or even even the communication of the sacraments, which will give you salvation. So you are no longer able to access the elements that grant you salvation, which is the bread and the wine that is taken in the Lord's and in the Eucharist, the Mass. So for Catholics, even to this day, they believe that Mass gives them salvation. Okay? They have to take Holy Communion. Protestants don't take Holy Communion very seriously, right? Sometimes they don't even take it at all. They take it once a month, right? But for the Catholics, it, their very life, spiritual life, so it's a, it's a very big 
world of difference between these Catholics and Protestants. But once Martin Luther got kicked out of the church and you know, uh, outside the open, his, his brand of religion, known henceforth as Lutheranism, uh, was the first among many other Protestant uh, denominations. Right? And it was the same Lutherans uh, almost 200 years later under this Schleimacher guy who was also a trained Lutheran to challenge even Protestant ideas about society and life, right? And saying that, well, scientifically speaking, because from 1517 all the way to 17 something something, right? The Enlightenment, is it? Is it? Enlightenment. Is it? Well, um, enlightenment. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Not Enlightenment, Enlightenment. Enlightenment. Yeah. <laughs> and enlightenment. <laughs> yeah, the enlightenment happened in one seven hundred, uh, in the age of reason. Okay, and in this age of reason, they wanted to remove all what they call as superstition, which is religion, and uh, to say that you know we are all reasonable people, we don't have to believe in myths. Okay, and superstition, and more importantly. Covered this last week, uh, last lesson. So is Slime Marker a liberal or conservative? He is the father of modern liberalism. But isn't he like for the gospel? Yeah, but he said this, okay, this is what he said. He says actually most of what the Bible says in terms of when it comes to miracles and superstition and science and all that is not reliable. According to Slime Marker, right, religion. However, preserves a kernel, I wrote a word on the word book, a kernel of truth, right, found in this religious feeling. Okay. There's a German word for this, which at this point in time I can't recall, but it's like a German word, right? But it means religious feeling, right? Where you have a an what we consider this call as an encounter with God, a theophany of some sort. Okay. Now he says, you cannot argue against a religious feeling. You cannot, I mean, if I've had a religious feeling with God, I've encountered God, I mean, nobody can come around and say, you know, you didn't have the feeling, or the feeling is not real, right? You know, the feeling was real. The feeling did happen to you, right? And some, you know, like, Experience it more often than others, right? But in the case of Schleimacher, he probably had a religious feeling himself, right? Standing or singing a hymn and so on. So he said, everything else about whatever you can disbelieve, but one thing about religion that you can do or you can have is this feeling. Okay. So now this is basically stripping away everything about the Bible, almost everything about the Bible, from the Sinai experience to the parting of the Red Sea, to the stone tablets of the Ten Commandments, to, you know, and then so many others, right? You know, the walls of Jericho falling down, and Jesus, you know, walking on water, Jesus, you know, turning the, the, the water into wine, Jesus feeding the 5,000, even Jesus resurrecting from the dead, okay, which is the foundation of Christianity. And uh, when you begin to make this claim that religion is only about the feeling and not about objective historical fact, then you have done the same thing as Schleimacher did, you know, 200 years ago, 300 years ago. And because of what he said, it affected generation after generation of German theologians, you know, even up to this day, that they and with so many others now in all the other major theological schools today, all believe with the German theologians that the Bible is just a collection of stories of which there are no historical value. That means they do not tell actual historical events. You cannot rely on their historicity. You cannot rely on it as a source for historical events, as opposed to, let's say, uh, other historian like um, uh, uh, Tacitus or Josephus or 
you know, all these other historians, right? They say these these theologians, theologians, right? Supposedly Lutherans, right? You know, Christians, right? Say that you know you can't really rely on the Bible as a historical document. Okay? Now, unfortunately for us in divinity, we have to learn what the characters are saying. We have to learn who is saying what, and we have. I've given you a foretaste of that with this German guy Julius Wellhausen, who said that the God, the the first five books of the of the Torah are not written by Moses, which is was the conservative view even to this very day. Uh, he says that the five books are written by you know four authors, okay? and they are the Yahwehs, the Elohim, the Priestly, and the Deuteronomies, uh, right? And they all have their own agendas. Okay, so let's look at another example of this. Okay, now the, the, before you kind of like saying, okay, wow, you know, uh, what are we supposed to do? Right? The, the fact of the matter is that some of their arguments are actually pretty interesting, if I may say, right? Or even pretty compelling. The word here is compelling, right? You know, they will compel you to think that maybe that is really true. Uh, they, they, some of them have valid points, such as like I mentioned before, that uh, in the book of Deuteronomy, the last part where Moses dies and the people mourn for 30 days, right? Uh, one of the first things that Julius Wellhausen asks is, who wrote that? Well, I mean, some people can reply, well, it could have been added by a, by a, by a scribe. Now, if a scribe could add that little bit in, who knows what other else that scribes can put in? And then they begin to see certain things inside the text which raises lots of questions. So they try to put together a, uh, you know, almost like a CSI kind of investigation here, looking at all the, the clues and the words are the clues. The words that are used are the clues. Like the words they use for the name of God, right? As we examined before, you know, the two stories, one using one use of his, one using Elohim, right? And then the two creation stories, you know, and then, you know, and, and many other different uh, examples we looked at. Uh, but now we are looking, I'm going to give you more and more examples of uh, how this so-called, uh, what is known as, what I introduced to you as this thing called temple propaganda. This is what they use, right? Okay, now, let me say that uh, these liberals believe that even to this day, um, there is a group of Jews, Jew, I mean, who are from the Judah, from the southern, uh, southern country. There's the only one that survived, okay? And uh, they are trying to tell us something by the way they recorded these Old Testament texts. And you begin to see certain interesting things about uh, the text if you're actually looking for it. If you're not looking for it, you won't see it, right? You're just like, hmm, what else is coming? Right? But if you're looking for it, you suddenly realize, hey, how come I didn't notice this? How come I didn't see this? Right? When you can see it, you then begin to ask a question like, uh, why more? Why is it like that? Why, why, why is the Bible like that? Nobody told me anything about this, you know, and uh, what is the case, right? So these scholars, liberal scholars, will seek to, I mean, conservatives don't talk about it that much, even though it's there staring at you in the face in the text. Uh, I mean, you know, these liberals are just saying, look at this text, look at it. I mean, like, I gave an example like the, the creation story, right? You don't go to church and they tell you, oh, there are actually two creation stories and one uses the name of God and one uses the name of Yahweh. No pastor does that, right? But it's the liberals who say that, right? And, and when you look at it, yeah, the fact is there, right? It is God, 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 all the way. And then, why is the way all the way for the second, the second part, right? So, uh, now that you look at it, you kind of like, oh, but then, as I've said, you know, it doesn't necessarily mean just because it's there that therefore there is two authors, right? Uh, and even if it's two authors, it may not necessarily be the Yahweh's author and the Elohim's author per se, right? Maybe the Elohim's author or whoever that writes with the name of God can be somebody else who just, just says, oh, this is one of the very old stories. And, and in that story, you know, why is our case is known as God? So he just uses God. That's it. Just for that particular time. By the way, uh, just just in case uh, you, you kind of start to wonder, like, oh, you know, if that's the case, then JPD is a, is a new way of looking at it. Yes, it's a new way of looking at it, and it was, unfortunately, the way that most Bible scholars were using for almost 100 years. But after that, since then, and now, currently, 
people are beginning to say the JEPD documentary hypothesis way of looking at the Torah is too problematic. As I've said kind of a little bit last week, I mean last time. Which is to say the JEPD kind of thing is it's very difficult to say whether it really is the case. Because there are a lot of parts where the name of God are all mixed up. Like the Lord your God. And some parts uses the Lord, some parts uses God. You know, it's, it's more mixed up than let's say the nice little kind of story uh, uh, snippets of Gobbets, right? You know, sections like the story of Abraham in Gerar, right? You know, and he goes to the king Abimelech and says, you know, da da da. So some things are not so clear cut. Some parts where, you know, you have just God, 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 and at the end you have Elohim already. What is that? So some say, ah, it is the Yahweh who is anything. Okay? So, I mean, how do you draw the line between which, where the editing starts and where it stops? Right? In, in, in actual fact, you know, you don't go about looking at a book and saying, okay, how much is edited and how much is not edited, right? Yeah, there are a lot of, like, fan fiction, for example, right? Fan fiction is heavily edited, am I right? You know, there's a basic text, okay, and then somebody comes along and just like modifies it, edits it, right, and puts in new things, expands little parts of the story, you know, uh, puts in an extra dialogue, you know, to this character or the scene, and so on and so forth. And it, it makes the story a bit richer in a sense. But then, uh, after so many editions, it's very hard to kind of say, okay, this one was written by what, and this one was an ironic kind of stuff. It's very hard to really keep track of all the modifications that have taken place. So in the end, people just kind of accept it as, ah, this is the work of this one. So, like, I mean, unfortunate, the most unfortunate example I can think of, and the only one I can think of actually, is Fifty Shades of Grey. Okay, I personally have not read it, uh, but it's a confession here. Uh, but, uh, uh, or a disclaimer or a clarification. But uh, it's based on popular fan fiction of Twilight, which is also based on something else, right? The Twilight series of, you know, this unknown girl falling in love with this very rich, famous, powerful, you know, whatever person. Sorry? Um, vampire. Yeah, yeah, vampire. But actually, this concept of an unknown girl falling for a, you know, rich, whatever, you see that a lot in, like, Japanese anime and all this, uh, manga and all that kind of stuff, right? You know, a lot of stories, similar kind of stories. Uh, even like the story of Beauty and the Beast, okay? Beauty and the Beast, you know, this powerful prince, uh, you know, all that kind of stuff, he's a horrible guy, and then she kind he's of falls in love with him, sorry? No, no, I think right? he's a horrible guy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he's supposed to be a horrible guy and things like that. Then she falls in love with him, and that's all that is needed. He doesn't really need to change, you can see. Uh, he's still a horrible guy, <laughs> right? And then uh, because of her love for him, you know, whatever. So, I mean, we see a little bit of that. I mean, uh, 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 in the case of Twilight, you know, uh, Robert Pattinson or the what's the guy's name, uh, the, the, the vampire, huh? Edward. And Edward doesn't really change, does he? He, he kind of like uh, doesn't suck people's blood as much as all these other vampires can do, right? But he's still a vampire. Huh? He was already he, Yeah, he was already controlling himself, right? Yeah. But he's still a vampire. You know, he, he can't change that. Yeah, he can't change that, right? You know, he was still a horrible person, and it worked, <laughs> as it worked, okay? So, but, but... My now we know who is not team Edward. <laughs> okay. So, uh, but I mean, like, in the Fifty Shades of Grey, I mean, it's a kind of uh, uh, more contemporized kind of uh, explanation of, okay, this, this, this guy with horrible, you know, fetish or whatever, right? He, he, he's very rich, powerful, da da da. This unknown girl falls in love with him, you know, and da da da, okay? So, uh, you know, the, 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 the girl who wrote this Fifty Shades of Grey, I can't remember the author, what's her name? Yeah, yeah, E.L. James or something. You know, she, she's basically taking a lot of edited stuff and putting it together and putting in her own thing, but she gets the credit for it, right? So, likewise, if you want to look at, look at let's say, the Torah, you know, uh, it could be that all this stuff was written by different people, but Moses gets the credit for it. What, what's wrong with that? You know, whereas the Bible scholars have said, ah, you know, you see this change here, you see that difference here, ah, it's taken from this other story, that one is an older story, and nah, 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 and therefore it means that there's so many writers and authors and all that. Yes, we know. Okay, there is a possibility that it, there is a lot of editing taking place, but the main guy that is said to take responsibility for these five books is Moses. But people can't, you know, the liberal scholars can't, can't accept that. They say, 
you know, because there's all these little clues of anything taking place, therefore we cannot accept a single authorship. But, but um, why so much focus on who wrote? Like, you know, I mean, like because it's very, very important. Because if Moses is the one who wrote it, then Moses is the one who originated the faith of the Jews. Whereas some scholars are saying that this whole Torah and all that was canonized and written in the post exilic period, as per our previous mm. lesson. You know, it was during a time where the people were so discouraged. Okay? I mean, the time and where it was written affects the text and the interpretation of the text. The context is in a way. Yeah, it sets the context for your understanding of the text itself. Because a text in itself, you know, uh, does not exist in a vacuum. We humans do not exist in a vacuum either. We are a daughter of so and so. We are of a particular ethnic group. You know, we have a certain kind of shade of our skin in that sense. I mean, can't just take you and then move you to like in the middle of Africa. Immediately you will stand up. You know, everyone will like, where are you from? And like, you say, why can't I be from here? And they say, no, you're not from here because your, your skin looks, the color is different. You have a different context. You belong to a particular context. That's it. And a text, you know, within that kind of thing. So this whole thing about anachronism, anachronism is very, very important to make sense of where a text belongs. And to be fair to some of the liberal scholars, they go through the text and they say, ha, you got something here that doesn't belong here if really Moses wrote it. Because Moses' time, in, at that time, they didn't have this kind of thing. Okay, let me give you a very good example. You see, there are two Hebrew words, okay? Two Hebrew words. One is Navi. Okay? Which is prophet. Yeah, the, the Arab, Arabs take a lot of words from the, the, the Hebrew and the Arabic, right? Um, and then there's the Jose, okay, which is a seer. Now, the Jose or Jose, which is with the, the H, right? You know, it's just <laughs> CH, the, the guttural sound, right? Um, and uh, this, this uh, seer is like basically like a fortune teller. Okay. You study all kinds of world religions, uh, you will notice that uh, most primitive world religions all have a shaman, witch doctor, you know, soothsayer, uh, medium, uh, you know, uh, whatever, right? You know, Kiao Tong, the Chinese call it, right? You know, all, even a bobo, right? Uh, in the Malay culture, right? In Indians will be the, the, the yogi, the, the, you know, the holy man or whatever it is, right? You have this seer guy, okay? Who can tell the future or tell the past or, or you know, even see dead relatives, right? Uh, in the Chinese, when you go to this this medium in the Chinese temple and you play the medium, say, can you, you know, uh, uh, tell me what my relative is going through? Give a lock of hair or give them a photo or something that has some kind of relation with the relative. And then this guy goes in no chance, right? And then he starts talking and acting like your relative without even knowing who the relative is. And all the relatives, or you know, the people related to, to this person, are suddenly just amazed because they say, this is exactly like the guy. Okay? And then he begins to say, oh, I'm suffering in hell. You know, you need to give me more money. You know, you, you need to burn me like two more cars. You know, because I've got lots of girlfriends here. You know, I want to bring them out and things like that. And then, then after the trance is over, this guy comes out back to normal. And then you ask the guy, how much is the car? Oh, nowadays, our uh, GSP, uh, you know, all that kind of stuff. One car, paper, uh, but very nice one. Uh, the latest Mercedes A class uh, is at least 1,000. Uh. Then you're like, huh? Paper, 1,000. Uh. Then this guy says, hey, you know, we are short of stuff. Uh. You know, we don't have enough people in the temple. You think everyone over in the temple, right? So you, we have to carve it out and build it properly, you know? You, and then now, of course, you know, recently there's a newspaper article that says that now people don't just burn the currency, one single note of money, they burn the entire bank. Send down to hell, okay? So these guys, they will say, you know, your relative is suffering and all that kind of stuff. So all these, you know, Chinese fellas who are some of them educated or whatever, they, they say, oh, okay, we will pay you, the, the guy, the medium, 
and you burn for us lah. Okay, in the what Hungry Ghost Festival where the date, the, the gates of uh, Hades will open, right? Every year, once a year, there's that period, one month, where the gates of Hades open and all the spirits come out, right? From, from hell, Hades. That's where the Chinese, or at least the Taoists, will burn all this stuff so that they can send it with them back to where they are, okay? So, uh, logically, it just doesn't make any sense at all, right? Even just, even if you don't even have to be a Christian to kind of like, this doesn't make sense at all, from, even from a, from a very basic, logical point of view. For example, like, if you're in hell, right? If you're in hell, right? You are already, you've already gone past, you've transcended space and time. If you tra- transcend space and time, then nothing in this world will make any kind of difference to you. Right? Because you're living in a timeless void of some sort. Okay, la, you may even be tortured for some, for some extreme cases, like 18 level. Right? So some demons are torturing you. You wait for time to go and enjoy your, your, your cars or whatever it is. And furthermore, you know, if you're in space time, something that is beyond space time, you all these passions that we have on Earth right now make no sense or make no they have no relation whatsoever with those people who are now in Hades. Does that make sense? Okay. Secondly is, uh, then you say, okay, then how is it that the medium is able to mimic every single thing that, uh, well, what if one of these spirits who is torturing this relative of yours, okay, in Hades, knows how this guy walks? So the spirit just comes out, oh, my number has been called, right? It goes up to the medium, the evil spirit, and then go and possesses the, the, the medium, and then acts in the way that this guy has been that the way that he talks lah, right? Because he's torturing him all this while, man. <laughs> right? So I mean, yeah, you can you can pass off as that, and all the relatives wouldn't know, we wouldn't be the wiser, right? It's it's possible, right? So whatever it is, okay, whatever it is, these kinds of so-called uh, soothsayers, lah, witch doctors, shamans, they are located all across the world, right? You got you know this guy who's in touch with the spirit realm, but there is this Nabi. You see, in the Old Testament, they revere the Nabi. Why? Because the Nabi talk about future events. Most of these fortune tellers, right, they talk about future events for you. But they don't talk about future events for Malaysia or for the world, you know, for world events, right? At best, you get Feng Shui Master saying, oh, this year is going to be a year of struggle but ultimately success. Okay? In the beginning of the year, times will be difficult. You will struggle in your business. But if you persevere on and towards the middle part of the year, your money will come flowing in. Because it's the year of the goat. Right? So you, you, you've got to, like a goat, you've got to persevere on the mountain and then you will find the green pastures. Or like a very, the feng shui master line also and so and so. Right? So you, you get all these kind of predictions for the year but it's very local. It's still only for the country or for individuals. It doesn't talk about political systems. It doesn't talk about world governments, right? Changing, you know, and, and, and things like that. They, they, they don't predict or prophesy into the future, right? The, and most, they will tell you, oh, there's, there's this thing coming up, or you're, like, you're going to meet your life partner today, right? Or very soon. Right, this one just said, "Ha! Ah, I can see your face. You will meet your life partner very soon." So you are kind of like now, okay? You know, and you're you're more open to that possibility. But my point is to say that the Nabi are very different. Okay, they they transcend your individual interests and needs and wants, right, to a more national or international kind of perspective on the fate of nations. And, and even uh, people like Jeremiah and Isaiah and Ezekiel all speak not just to their own country, but to the countries around their country. Speaking out against their, their, their ethical practices, right? Which is again very, very un jose like right? Because the Jose kind of says, oh, you know, you, you've got bad luck on you, okay? I think there's some spirit following you, right? That's why you're having a series of uh, very unfortunate events following you, like your, you know, you got injured lah, your your boyfriend left you lah, whatever it is, you know, things like that. So you say, ah, I can smell the bad luck on you. So the way to, <laughs> the, the way to, to, to kind of mitigate that, right, is you need to take this charm, you need to buy this, you need to buy that. Always you have to pay money, right? Yeah. right? You know, so you you have to do this, do that, and all kind of stuff. Then um, there's some interest to the to the Jose, right? You know. 
then your bad luck will disappear, or I will pray for you, and then I will do a special dance for you, and then I will chase all your bad luck away, but you have to pay me now. Or some special favors. Okay. So that is how it goes. Even in the Old Testament, we have people like Samuel, who is described as a Jose. And Samuel, the last judge of Israel, is said to be able to be very, very linear. The Chinese call it Jose. Very powerful, very spiritually sensitive, right? Okay, and uh, and uh, but then you get something very strange okay, in that passage that describes Samuel. It says people, prophets of the time, were known as Hosea. Somebody in the future, or at least you know, later, 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 many hundreds of years later, say that prophets of the time were known as seers. It's kind of we saying, oh, you know, this Jalan, you know, Berbakti, known was formerly known as Jalan John Clifford, but now it's Jalan Bakti. Okay, so the prophets are like Jalan Bakti, right? And then you were kind of saying last time prophets were known as seers, and the word is used. What does that mean? It means that that writing was written much later. Okay. But the but the uh, the most perplexing thing about this whole thing, and, and again it's about words here, is when you go start even before Samuel, okay, where the little passage is found, we found out, find that in the book of Deuteronomy, which is supposed to be written, okay, let's let's look at the play of dates, okay? So Moses is supposed to be have written the five books when? According to your notes. Hello? Oh, one, uh, one, two, o, o, or one, four, o, o. Yeah, one, two, o, o, or one, four, o, depending on which, which era of the Egyptian ruler you want to cover. Is it Ramses or whoever? Okay. So it's either the Torah could be written in the earliest date, which is 1004 or 1002. Either way, this is the earliest date. Nothing earlier than that. Okay. The Torah is a purpose I book, right? Yeah. Then there is another school of thought that says it's written around 1000 during the time of David. So it's a later day. Didn't David echo... Uh, because, you see, David is supposed to say, Oh, I love your law, you know, your law is... Yeah. You know, I, I thirst for your law, things like that. Right? Uh, and all that, right? So, but this, this 1000 BC. Then there is the even later date, which is about 600 BC, written during the time of, no, 720 BC, 20. during the time of Hezekiah. Okay? Maybe Hezekiah was not. Then there is also another date, which is around 600 BC, which is during the Josiah's period. Which is the JEPD? Eh, JEPD. Uh, the documentary hypothesis, which is the date that the documentary. Well, they say different different writers are from different time periods, lah. Then one guy kind of like put it together. Oh. Okay. Then you've got the post-exilic uh, theory, which is around five hundred BC. Okay, which is post-exilic. The latest date. So the different scholars say we are not sure when the Torah was written. Some say here, some say here, some say here, some say here. Now the later you go, the more liberal you become. Okay. So uh, that's the scale. Okay. It's not a you know yes or no kind of thing, right? Uh, so now let's let's look at this. Um, so when I talked about this the other day, I said that you know some scholars believe that the Old Testament was written by these guys here to kind of boost the morale of the people, right? They invented the story of you know, Moses and the burning bush. Moses never really existed according to the biblical scholars. They say that Abraham never existed. And David ruled over a small little kingdom. In fact, some of them went so far as to say that David never actually existed as well. Then someone found evidence of David's existence. 
and then he say, okay, maybe they did existence, but he ruled over a small kingdom. Who knows? You know, in the next few years, right? Someone finds out this this you know artifact from David's time that is shows sophistication. It's like, okay, maybe David's kingdom was a little bit sophisticated. <laughs> you know, it happens all the time. All these liberals have to change their position a little bit more, okay? <laughs> to support the political position, but they all start off not believing in anything the Bible says, okay? So, which actually for a scientific inquiry, that's what you're supposed to do. You're not supposed to believe anything. You're supposed to say, okay, I'm going to test it out, right? And see whether it's legit. And that's what some archaeologists do. They say, we're not going to believe a single word of the Bible until it's proven with archaeological fact, right? So, they believe that people like Josiah and Zechariah existed. Now, recently, it's fairly recent, David, David we have proof of David's existence, okay? Some people even question Jesus' existence, which, uh, which is baffling when there's so much evidence outside of the Bible to say that Jesus actually was a human person. But that's a different story. Anyway, the post-exilic kind of theory that says uh, that uh, you know the, the Torah was written to kind of make people be more. So let's look at a few examples of proof, right? And this is where it gets interesting. I use one of it, I'll, I'll take the bigger one so it's easier for my reading. <laughs> okay. Now, um, let's turn to then that passage we're talking about, right? Not Samuel. So then you see that little note. I, I mentioned it once when we were reading that, that part uh, some time ago. And then uh, and then you see I'll come back to it when we actually study it. Okay, so let's go to um, let's go to where we are. It's first Samuel chapter nine, okay? 1 Samuel chapter 9, verse uh, 6 onwards, okay? Are you there? You must see it for yourself, then, then it's even more interesting, okay? So, uh, so this is the story, the context of it is the story of how Saul was anointed king okay, over Israel. So, but the sermon, if I look at this town, there's a man of God, he's highly respected, everything he says comes true. Let's go there now. Perhaps you will tell us what they think. The context of this particular story is how Saul was trying to look for some donkeys and then he, he was searching oh, high and low, he couldn't find it. And then one of his, the guys that was with him said, you know, maybe we should go to this town uh, where there is a man of God. Now, this man of God is actually Samuel. Okay? And uh, it's, he's described as highly respected and everything he says comes true. So very classic, Jose kind of thing. But then we'll see that later more, a bit more. It says, uh, Saul said to his servant, and this is classic uh, behavior when you go to see as a chose, right? Saul says, said to his servant, if we go, what can we give the man? The food in our sex is gone. We have no gift to take to the man of God, what do we have? So for a chose, a seer, you need to give something. But for a nabi, a prophet, he usually did not take any payment of any kind. In fact, in the case of Elisha, when the, when the, uh, the, the general of the Syrian army, Naaman, tried to Give him gold and all that. Uh, the, the prophet Elijah declined it, but his servant accepted it. And because of that, the servant was afflicted with uh, leprosy. So for prophets, they don't receive payment. Like Elijah, when he confronted Ahab, right, uh, he did not receive any payment uh, for that. Okay? So the payment thing is very important. Uh, then he says, uh, the servants answered him again, Look, he said, I have a quarter of a shekel of silver, I will give it to the man of God, so that he will tell us what we take. Now verse 9, this is the important so-called part. Formerly in Israel, if someone went to inquire God, they would say, Come, let us go to the Jose, the seer. Because the prophet of the day used to be called the seer. See that? You see that? Okay. Uh, sorry, now, so the prophet of today, of the word is that people were using this prophet. Okay. Now let's just fast forward. This is this story is said to have occurred before, way before King David. So most likely, maybe one thousand one hundred BC. Let's fast forward all the way to uh, maybe around six hundred BC, okay, during the time of Josiah, to Jeremiah. Now turn with me to the book of Jeremiah. Now, Jeremiah cannot be written in before, uh, before 600 BC, or, yeah. Jeremiah most likely was written 600 BC and later, right? So 500 something and so on, okay? 
So it's it's a pretty late book. Uh, not late back book, but it's a pretty late book. And sorry. Um, Jeremiah chapter 1, okay, uh, and uh, now it says chapter 1, verse 1, we know. The words of Jeremiah son of Hilkiah, one of the priests and Anathoth in the territory of Benjamin, the word of Wadi son of H came to him in the 13th year of the reign of Josiah, son of Ammon, king of Judah, and through the reign of Jehoiakim, son of Josiah, king of Judah, down to the 5th month of the 11th year of Zedekiah, son of Josiah, king of Judah, where the people of Jerusalem went to exile. So, up to the point where uh, uh, they went into exile, which is 586 BC. Okay? So now Jeremiah is said to have lived probably around 40 to 60 years, right? So probably around 6, 650 BC. So nothing earlier than 650 BC. Okay? Now it says here, verse 4 The word of Hashem came to me saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I said, Your father appointed you as a what? Prophet. Through the nation. Nabi to the nation. So even Jeremiah knew that this job was for a job for a Nabi, not a Jose. Right? So now, if you say, okay, fine, 1100, right? Okay, is known as Jose. La. Fine, I can I can I can understand that, right? They were primitive, whatever you call it by that name. Then later on, as time went on, after four to five hundred years, you know, then they changed the name to now it's no longer Jose, now it's be fine, I can accept that, right? Jeremiah is like the other end of the spectrum. But then the question remains is, wait a second. Turn with me to Deuteronomy chapter 18. Oh, they use Nabi, is it? Okay. Now, Deuteronomy 18 is supposedly written in 1280, Bible Okay, when he was giving his final speech to the people before they go into the and the earliest or the latest it can be uh, is 1,000 years. Okay. So because you need some time for them to take the land and, and settle, and then the cycle of the judges and all that stuff. The time period of David is pretty set, and it's roughly around 1,000 BC, based even based on the evidence there. So the 1,000 BC is an important marker. But how long did you know they take the cycle to live? And kind of some people actually did some calculation of the judges. With all the judges, including Samuel, and said how much time period we need to kind of go through the whole list, probably around 200 years. So 1,200 is like the minimum time which Moses would have written the book of Deuteronomy. Well, what does it say in Deuteronomy? Chapter 18, verse 14 here. It says, verse 14, the, the nations you will dispossess, listen to those who practice sorcery and divination, but as for you, the Lord your God, or Hashem, your Elohim, has not permitted you to do so. Hashem, your Elohim, will raise up for you a Jose. Is it Jose? No, no. A Nabi. Okay. A Nabi like me from among you, from your fellow Israelites. You must listen to him, for this is what you ask of, the, of Hashem, your Elohim, on Horeb, on the day of the assembly, when you say, let us not hear the voice of Hashem. Our Elohim will not see this great by anymore, or we will die. What they say is good, I will raise up for them a prophet, a Nabi like you from among the fellow Israelites, and I'll put my words in his mouth. He will tell them everything I command him. I myself will call the kind one that does not listen to my words, that the Nabi speaks in my name. But the Nabi who presumes to speak in my name, anything I have not commanded, or a Nabi who speaks in the name of other gods, is to be put to death. You're like, huh? Okay, so Wait a minute, then you get to Samuel's story, which is about 1,100, 100 years later, and then he says, we want to go and see the Chose. Right? You know, the Saul is talking with his guys, like, oh, let's go and see the Chose, right? <laughs> later on, we see in 1 Samuel, so when they talk about Samuel, they refer to him as a seer. They actually, they say, okay, the seer is this and da 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 right? You know? Ah, verse 11 is in verse 7 chapter 9. As they were going up the hill, this is the same part where he says, you know, in those times a prophet was known as the uh, uh, Chosei. But then he says here, verse 11, as they were going up the hill to the town, they met some young women coming out to draw water and they asked him, is the Chosei here? So even at that time when they were writing the story, they were recording that this is the name that they use for a, a man of God, of Hashem. Right? He's even called a Jose. So if Deuteronomy, which is written much earlier than this, says 
says I will raise up in a B equation. What does that mean? Could it be that the part where, uh, at that time it's called a trose, be written like edit, you know, like reduction? Yeah, could it be? The, the fact still remains that the people of the time, okay, even if Samuel is written later, right, the people of the time were still using quotes. So the question is not the Samuel passage, the, the question is Deuteronomy passage. Whether or not it's before. Yeah. And it's not just this, there's, there's a lot of other references to prophet, right? So you want to, you want to change the prophet, you want to change a lot of stuff in Deuteronomy. Or, like the people say, it was not written in 1200 BC. It was written much later. But why can't wording change? Very unlikely. I mean, like elf. You know, an elf is actually. Uh, a mythical figure, right? Which a lot of different people use in different stories, right? Elven, this la, elven, that la, things like that. And when you get to like uh, the Lord of the Rings, right? The battle between the elves and the dwarves, right? You know, the word dwarf is a, probably a very ancient word, and the word elf is also probably an ancient word. And even like you know, you read any Python, you know, what, you elf here, you know, elf there, or what you know. Uh, uh, what a grim story that, oh, you meant this little elf here, little elf there. It's easy to change the term. Okay? They could have changed the term. Right? Like, like even today, you know, you have the forest elf, you have the sea elf, you have this, but the elf is still the same thing. They still use the word elf to indicate the office of that kind of person with 20 years, you know, living in the forest or it's, you know, whatever. So the question here is, why is the word prophet used in such an early book? Because it's not an early book. Very compelling time. Very compelling time. Now you'll be like, okay, la, okay, la, Mr. Yosha, you mean, la. what do you say? How do you reply? Okay, what's your response? Well, I would say that uh, Deuteronomy still retains some of Moses's but it has probably been reworked during the time of Josiah, 600 years. Yeah, because there was the time where he... Uh, Josiah is said to have found the book of the law in the temple, which had been, yet had been you know, uh, dormant for many years. Okay, let's turn to that. Okay. Turn to First Kings. Actually, I'm going to Let's look at it. Ah, Second King chapter 22. This is referred to by all these people's scholars out there. Like, ah, what is this book here? Okay. Now it says, um, uh, chapter, 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 chapter. Chapter 22, verse 8. Okay, chapter 22 was 8. Hilkiah, now this Hilkiah right, is the same Hilkiah that Jeremiah is descended from. Hilkiah is Jeremiah's father. Right? You just not read. Jeremiah, son of Hilkiah from Anathoth. Right? Yeah, his father is Hilkiah. The thing is, his father is a high priest. So Jeremiah is like a pastor's kid. Right? So, uh, problematic pastor's kid. Right? Because the high priest was very close with the king. And Jeremiah is thinking he's the king. Anyway, verse 8. Hilkiah the high priest said to Shaphan the secretary, I have found the book of the law in the temple of Hashem. He gave to Shaphan who read it. Then Shaphan the secretary went to the king and called him. Well, has paid out the money and, is, uh, and have entrusted in the rulers. Then he says, uh, Hilkiah the priest has given me a book. Shaphan read it from read from it in the presence of the king. When the king heard the words of the book of the law, he tore his robes. He gave his orders to Hilkiah the priest, Akikam of Shaphan, Akro son of Mikhaya. So on go and inquire of Hashem for me and for the people for all Judah about what is written in this book that has been found. 
great in such an anger that burns against us because those who have gone before us have not obeyed the words of the book. They have not accepted the accordance with all that is written there concerning us. Okay. So, this book of the law is like uh, purposely this story of the Yukia finding it is purposely put in there for all the little scholars. No, I mean, the story is real, perhaps, okay, but it creates a problem for the little scholars. Why? Because the little scholars have to say, now, if it's written after the exam, you get to totally write it out of the picture. Ah, you cannot take this view that it was written after the exam. Then what is the book of the law that was found in the temple in 600 BC, 100 years earlier? Then you know the liberal say? The liberal say, ah, the whole Torah was not established at the time. It was just copies or at least some form of Moses' sermons that is now known as Deuteronomy. It was not known as Deuteronomy at the time. It was just known as the book of the law. So, but you don't get the full form of the five books that we get today. Right? That's how the liberals answer it. Right? So they say it still goes back to our GEP data that the five books is still written by four different authors during the post exilic period. And that an editor, an editor worked on this book of the law after they came back from exile, and then we have the full form that we have in today. So the problem with biblical scholarship, we do this kind of stuff, right? Divinity and all that, right? Biblical is that there's a lot of this kind of back and forth like aha about this part and aha about that part, right? Because all the data that we have is in the text. Okay? So if you don't know the data, you don't know the scripture, you can be flanked or you can be, you know, uh, broadsided by some other biblical scholars who may not necessarily believe the Bible but knows the Bible better than you, we do, right? And then says, ha, how about this passage or ha, how about that passage? And you say, wow, such an obscure passage, right? In that case. Like normally you just read through, like, oh, okay, found the book of the law, just move on. But then here, it serves as a very important marker as to whether the Torah was written before or after the exile. Because if it's written after the exile, then the Torah serves its function to be a morale booster, and a lot of the stories of the, of the Torah cannot be trusted. But if it was written before the exile, then there is a high chance that Moses existed, because it's the book of the law that was written by Moses. Now, some liberal scholars say it is not written by Moses. It was the whole system was invented by the priests. And some even go so far as to say that Hilkia was the one who wrote it. <laughs> yes, there are liberal scholars who actually believe that. They believe that there was no first five books of the law, and that it was Hilkia who wrote the book of the law and went to Josiah and says, Look, you have not been keeping the book of the law of God. Temple propaganda, right? Which we will get to uh, in a later in uh, the next lesson. Okay? Yeah. Your your reaction exactly. <laughs> My sentiments exactly right. <sighs> I can't believe it. Look how rubbish this is. Right? <laughs> Unfortunately, this is what like majority of the political scholars today in all the top universities we need. Okay? So I'm welcoming you to the annoying you know, part of the right? Which is like the main part of it, okay? So, yeah, we will carry on lesson 16 later. Don't erase. Okay, Anna. Yeah.